Well, thank you, everybody. Um, the first six months I worked at the National Center for Healthy Housing, my mom couldn't figure out what I was doing. But when I showed her that video, she was like, oh, great. Now she tells everybody else like I work here. So I'm like, well, that's a good introduction. Um, so I've already introduced our speakers. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Elders. And it's an honor to have you here. Thank you, Julie. And thank each of you for being here. And we want to thank our representatives, Slaughter, Hunter, and Greek Hallway for hosting this briefing. I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak to you. I come to you wearing a variety of hats. That of a mother, pediatrician, former Arkansas State Health Director, and that of a Surgeon General. And all of these roles, our primary mission has been that of protecting children. I want to talk about why it's imperative that we address lead poisoning and about the effects of hazardous housing among America's children. Lead is a neurotoxic substance and it's been shown to affect brain function and brain development. This is an issue that is important now as it's ever been and I want to urge Congress and the rest of you here today, not to turn your backs on federal prevention and remediation programs, which have the potential to completely eradicate lead poisoning in this country. We've come a long way in reducing lead exposure in the United States. Actions taken by your Congress and government agencies to reduce lead in gasoline lead in workplaces and homes have resulted in a 90% decline in blood lead since 1980. In a recent article, the Washington Post called the reduction one of the greatest public health success stories of the 20th century. Just because we reduced lead 90%, does not mean we're finished. We've got to make sure we take care of that last 10%. Inside aging homes in cities like Baltimore, Philadelphia, Boston, Chicago, and many other cities, a secret culprit continues to strike our most valuable resource, our children. According to the CDC, 500,000 children across this country are poisoned by lead. Millions more are still at risk. Despite our relative successes, lead poisoning is still a public health ep epidemic in this rich country. The home, as you just heard, should be a safe place, a place where families grow strong, a place where children learn the skills and values they need to succeed in the world. Yet, by not finishing the fight against lead poisoning, we allow those very same homes to poison our children day after day. Research has found that even very low levels of lead exposure can have a detrimental impact on a child's health and well-being. What we told is a safe blood lead level can result in a brain disability. A safe level can result in diminished IQ, low educational attainment, diminished reading readiness at kindergarten entry. There is no safe blood lead level. This creates ripple effects on the social, physical, and economic well-being of children in low-income families who are disproportionately affected by lead poisoning. If you truly believe in a level playing field, that all kids deserve to be able to succeed if they make the effort, if you truly support children's health, you must acknowledge that this epidemic 
creates a disparity between children based on their respective zip codes. You shouldn't be able to determine the length of your life or your learning skills based on the zip codes in this rich country, yet we know we can. It is a disparity which has long lasting effects on these children's ability to learn, to access higher education, to work, and to live productive, healthy lives. Lead poisoning has a documented effect on the academic performance of a child. Policymakers must know that there are educational issues that cannot be solved in the classroom, as you just heard Julie say. And there are learning challenges that educational reform will never address. Just because you have better teachers and better all of the other opportunities, if you have a child who's been poisoned and injured, brain injured, these fixtures will not solve the problem. In the same Washington Post article that I quoted earlier, a copy of which you have, Richard Rothstein of the Epic Economic Policy Institute notes, and I quote, efforts to improve academic outcomes for the increasing number of poor children in public schools focus too heavily on incentives aimed at teachers in schools instead of taking on the underlying conditions that hamper children even before the inner formal school. In short, if we really want our children to succeed in school, we must help them in their homes. The way to solve these problems is to identify hazards in the home early, not only lead, but also other housing-based threats, such as mold, pests, radon, carbon monoxide, before they cause lasting damage. We must continue to improve and support early childhood screening for them, as well as home repair programs where hazards exist. In the many states where such programs do exist, they must be implemented and receive federal support. HUD's lead hazard control and healthy homes programs have a long lasting history of improvement and has been shown to save at least $17 in educational, criminal justice, and other costs for every dollar spent. We spend almost 18% of our gross domestic product on health, and yet we cannot brag about being the healthiest country out there despite our large spending. We, our healthy outcomes are frequently worse, in fact. Just as not all educational issues can be addressed in the classroom, not all health problems are addressed in the doctor's office or in hospitals. What would these costs be like if we spent more focusing on prevention instead of repair? As director of the Arkansas Department of Health, I prioritized early every day keeping children healthy. I oversaw a tenfold increase, as you heard, in the number of childhood screenings, and nearly doubled the immunization rate for two-year-olds by having real commitments. And I oversaw surveillance of lead poisoned children and sparked home investigations that identified and addressed the source of problems. As Surgeon General, I relentlessly promoting prevention and addressing the societal causes of illness and injury, including hazards in the home, endangering health, including lead. This charge has been continued by other Surgeon Generals, including Dr. Benjamin, who had a Surgeon General's call to action on healthy homes in 2009 to address the crisis of hazardous homes. She called for testing homes for lead, radon, and carbon monoxide, for training home visit staffs to assist low-income families, 
for using evidence-based innovation to certify houses as healthy and workplace and work together across agencies and sectors to support safe, decent, and affordable housing. I want to repeat these three conditions. Safe, decent, affordable. No family should have to choose between these different items. Housing is neither that's not decent, is not neither affordable. The people living inside of them are safe. I urge Congress to follow the action, the call to action of the Surgeon General. I urge Congress to fully fund programs that identify children affected by substandard housing. We need the three legs of the stool, including CDC, to carry out the surveillance and find the pockets of lead poisoning that still exist, and investigate the sources and provide outreach and education. We need HUD to make the homes of the impacted children healthy and lead safe. We need EPA to continue strong regulation and oversight to keep the poison out of the air, water, and products that Americans breathe, drink, and use. I commend the Senate, and especially Senators Collins, Reed, Blount, and Murray, for proposing level funding for both programs in difficult budget environments. I strongly urge that their colleagues in the House revise their proposal with their proposed cuts to make sure that we have healthy housing. But that's not enough. We must increase resources to find and eliminate lead hazards one and all. We don't have cures or solutions Yet for 